God. Let's listen to this word. I've never seen anything like this, but I kept seeing, well, it actually started with my daughter. She was doing this and she had both hands up. This is the I love you symbol. And she was doing this. And I felt like God was like, that's what I want all my people to do. It's like to lift up. And then I, I remembered all of a sudden, I've been reading in Leviticus, which is kind of a tough chap or book to get through. And God reminded me though about wave offerings. And it says uh, in Leviticus 23, nine, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land that I am going to give you to reap its harvest, you shall then bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath and the priest will wave it. And so the whole idea is that this whole land came from Papa God. All of it came from Him. And then the way that we show that we recognize it's His is we take the first fruits, the first portion, and we bring it to the Lord and we say, it's all yours, God. It's all yours. It came from you and it goes back to you and I bring it all. And here we are at the first of the year. This is our first fruit. The land that we're inhabiting is right before us. This 2021 is our land. It's our year, but it belongs to the Lord and it came from the Lord. And so right now, I feel like we're supposed to prophetically like live Lift up our hands as a wave offering, all of us in the room, and wave it to the Lord and say, this is yours, God. All that we are, all that we have came from you, and it will all go back to you for your glory, Lord Jesus, for your glory, Lord Jesus. So as we're singing this, I just want you to even imagine things that you've maybe reserved as not being holy, as not being God, and bring it before Him and say, it's all yours, God. I empty my pockets, I empty my hands, and I bring Bring it to you, Father. You have your way this year in 2021. Have your way, God. Amen. Let's sing you're worthy. Because you are worthy of it all. And so, yeah, I just want to, I just have one little word of knowledge I wanted to pray for. And, and so this is how it works. If you guys are new here, sometimes the Holy Spirit will just bring an impression. Maybe someone has pain and he'll, 
he'll highlight specific places where someone has pain. And then so if that's you, to, you're not in trouble. We just want to pray for healing and for a miracle. And so during worship, when Sierra was leading, I just felt the left side of my head like really strong that someone needed healing there. Is that anyone in the room? It's the left side. Maybe you get really bad migraines on your left side or, or anything like that. Okay, that's Zane. Okay. Any, anyone else? I feel like there's a couple more people. Okay. So if that resonates for you, just stand up if that's you. And maybe they come from time to time. It's okay. So we got a few. So Lord, we just thank you for your healing presence right now. And so Jesus, we take authority over all pain, all sickness and disease. And we exalt the name of Jesus over everyone here. Yeah, God, we thank you for your miraculous power that's here. And so, Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's say you have something else, too, like God, I mean, he loves everyone here. So even if we don't call it out, that doesn't mean you can't be healed of whatever you got, too. Okay? So that's the good news. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, okay. It's a packed house. Packed house. It's awesome. Well, uh, I got one little message to tell everybody, and that's this. Jesus is king. Jesus is, Jesus is Lord. He's king. He's the ruler of all things. He's the one. Um, I'll, I'll, take your, I'll take your advice under advisement. I'll take it to the Lord. I'll pray about it. But Jesus is king. How's that for an answer? <laughs> It's a good answer. Praise God. Well, we're going we're gonna, to um, open up the Bible, and we're going to talk about the Bible, because in the Word of God is life. In the Word of God comes, comes life, and uh, every good and perfect thing comes from God, who is, every good and perfect gift comes from God. And the way he delivers his good and perfect gifts is through the Word. If he's going to raise the dead, if he's going to heal the sick, he's going to send a Word, and it's going to heal them. That's just how he does it. If he wants to make stars, he speaks the word. If he wants to make sun and moon, he speaks the word. If he wants to create things, he speaks the word. Everything comes by the word. And we've got this amazing thing that's called the word of God that we have in our possession. And, uh, and this is no light thing. This is what we live by. We are people of the book. And this book leads us. It contains and it holds. And, and when we take this... Okay, now I, I'm sorry to tell you anything, but the book itself is not a good luck charm, all right? If I throw this in the street and a car runs over it, God did not get run over by a car, all right? But if I open this Bible and the words come out and go into my heart, that's the living word of God. That is the living, I am connecting with the living word of God, and uh, that's where all life comes. So anyway, I don't know, I just thought I'd say all that. Let's pray and, and, and look at the word tonight. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for life. We thank you for who you are. Jesus, you are the Lord. You are the Lord of lords, the King of kings. You're the Lord of the church. And we say, be the pastor of your people. Be the teacher of your people. Be the good shepherd over us, Lord God. Put your arms around us and bring us who are wandering to the edge of the fence People who are just questioning and wondering, Lord God, bring, uh, bring your love to draw them in closer to yourself, Lord God. Let your love be like a, like a vortex. It just draws us to the center, continually drawing us. Lord, we want to be lost in the middle of your presence, in the middle of who you are. In Jesus' name, everyone said? Amen. Amen. I'm going to talk about a survival kit. And... Uh, and there's a survival kit. I, I, I feel like we need to put together a survival kit. And a survival kit is a thing you grab, and then when, you're, when you leave the house, you've got everything you need. You've got all the essentials. And I'm going to talk about a survival kit that only has three things in it. But if you have these three things, you have everything that matters. All right? And it's found in... Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So I'm going to talk about these three things. You can, you can forget everything else and just focus on these three things, and you will have everything for eternity. You will not lose one thing throughout all eternity if you, if you base your lives on these three things. Right on? 
So let's get to experts on these three things. Okay, so start with faith. We're going to start with faith. The most powerful force on earth. Faith can move mountains. Without question, the most powerful force on earth. Matthew 17, 20, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Only if you have faith. Once you have faith, you have unlimited power. That's pretty cool. I like that. And here's, here is why faith always works. I want to give you an illustration. Faith always works because it sees the answer already. It already sees the answer. Okay? And I, I, want, I have an illustration. Who's got some sunglasses that I can borrow? Anybody? Oh, dang it. Okay, let's just pretend. You have some, I'll use yours. They're girl sunglasses, but that's okay. These are faith glasses. This is great. Now look, the illustration is this. Yeah, this, 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 this is good. This is, this is really good. Let's say I, I'm gonna, I want to make a comparison between faith, eyes of faith, and these glasses. Let's say I have these glasses, and when I put them on, I can see lost money. I can just see where lost money is. Uh, you know, I can, I can look and I can see wherever lost money is. Did you know that there is a lot of lost money in, in the world? There is $60 billion sunk under the water. $60 billion. If you, had, if you had a scuba suit, you could just probably go get a lot of that. <laughs> oh, and you'd need my glasses. But I'll, I'll give you my glasses for half, half of what you find. Anyway, there is also... Um, $340 million buried in Texas alone. I don't know. I, in Texas alone, there's $340 million buried, lost and buried. In the couches of America, there's $200 million, they estimate. $200 million just lost in the couches. Now, what if, if you could just put on the glasses and you would see, oh, hey, there's 10 bucks there, and, and, and you just start seeing things. What is this? What is this? And you walk to it, and you see, you'll see, oh, my gosh, under the ground right here is, is you know, $80,000. So you dig it up, bam. It's because you see. Now, listen, that's what faith is like. When you put these glasses on, you act different because you see things for what they are. You see where the treasure is. You see it. You're not guessing. You're not wandering. It is actually focusing you on something else. All right? And so when you, put, when you have faith in your life, you are seeing something on people and you're seeing something in your life. It's like, oh my gosh, I see that God is meet, meeting your needs. I'm not inventing this. I am seeing something by virtue of the Holy Spirit on you, a gift of faith. I am seeing you healed. I am seeing God moving on your life. This is faith. People think faith is some kind of wonderful, amazing thing, but all it is is somebody seeing something, and they're just saying, it's, this is the simplest thing in the world. I'm simply seeing something and talking about it. Does that make sense to you? Faith is not mysterious. Faith is getting a information from God and simply acting normal from that point on. You just simply act, oh my gosh, I see that you're, you're blessed. I see something in your life. I see, I have a knowledge of something. And so therefore, praise God, that's what faith is all about. You act different because you see something different. And it always brings the treasure. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. And, and, and faith will cause you to see God's love over people. It'll, faith will cause you to see God's love over your own life. People that have faith don't think they're doing anything difficult. It's no big deal. God just shows me things. Okay, so, and that's the, that's the mystery resolved about what faith is. Faith isn't anything amazing. You're just hearing God, and you're just oper, act, acting on what you heard. Okay? Faith can look at the facts and still see the truth. Romans 4.19, without weakening in his faith, he, Abraham, faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. You can actually see facts and still know that the truth is something else. 
That's faith. That's a powerful faith. You just have a knowing. You just know that this is happening. And everyone says, no, it's not going to happen. You're like, I don't care what you say. I know this is going to happen. I know the promise of God will not, will not return empty. The word of God is not going to change. This is going to happen. Faith is awesome. Faith is awesome. But here's the thing. I want to talk about how we get there. How do we get to faith? How do we get to this kind of faith? We start with hope. This is how I believe it works. We start with hope. The first thing we do is we have hope. Okay, the first thing we say when we're on our journey to faith is, I don't know how or when, but it will work out. I don't know how or when, because I haven't totally got the glasses on yet, but I know it's going to work out. And this is hope. This is an absolute convinced person that it is going to work out. Hope is coming. Hope is there. Then faith comes out of your hope. Faith is birthed out of your hope. Bible hope is the greatest feeling of all time. Think about a kid at Christmas. Okay, I want, I want you to remember that hope is something that's going to last eternally. And Bible hope is the ma most amazing thing in the world because you're anticipating something absolutely incredible. And the Bible says that that is going to last through eternity. Every day, you're going to be psyched out of your mind about what's coming in the future. People think you're going to float around and, and strum harps and sing a song, the same song over and over for thousands and thousands of years. That's not possible if hope is eternal. If hope continually is eternal, you're going to be psyched out of your mind about what's just ahead of you. Because it's going to be so amazing and different and fantastic. You know, the angels in, in heaven, they're constantly saying, they're, they're around the throne, and they're constantly saying, holy, holy, holy. The reason they're constantly saying that is because new revelations of the unique character of God are washing over them. Every time they get a new powerful revelation, they say the word holy. Yeah. And so what are they saying? Holy. Holy. Now, holy doesn't mean, wow, you act really, you know, nice. Holy means this, you are unique. There is nothing like you. You are in a class all by yourself. Nobody can compare it to you. So things are holy when they've been separated out. And God is in a whole category. That's why the word for him is holy. And so these angels are constantly saying, wow, wow, whoa. And then the hope is that we know that there's going to be something fabulous just coming up. So that's an eternal thing you can look forward to. That's cool. Yep. It's the joyful expectation of good that will happen forever. God banishes our hopelessness. Romans 4.17 says, He is the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they, they were. Calls things that are not as though they were. With God, there, will, there is always more to your story. In life right now, in your life right here with God, there's always more to the story. The story is not over. He can bring anything back. He can bring anything back. Whatever the, the canker worm and some other lousy insect chews up, he's going to restore all those things. Everything that's been damaged by the enemy, by some kind of thing that, that knocked the feet out from under you decades ago, all that is going to be paid back. That is the hope of knowing that God is going to bring, restore all things back to you. And it's good. We are supposed to be, we are to be a people of hope. And our greatest example is Abraham. And what, it, what he does, we imitate. Romans 4.11, he, Abraham, is the father of all who believe. And listen, Abraham's hope level, I want to go back to his story. In, in 4.18, Romans, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations against all hope. This is how we're supposed to, this is how we're supposed to have hope against all hope. Abraham in hope believed. Okay. This, this refers to unusual hope. When you're, when you're hoping against all hope, standard hope is this. I get a gift for my birthday. I hope I get something nice. That is standard. But unusual hope is God's going to raise the dead son I just sacrificed. That is unusual hope. 
That is at a level that is like crazy. And God endorses that kind of hope for us because Abraham's the example of that. So if you have crazy, out-of-the-world hope that God's going to restore everything, then God is saying, well done to you. Yeah, I want you to hear it. God's saying, well done. Keep it up. Because this is the way Abraham was. This is how Abraham was. I, I believe all things. I hope for all things. Good. You're in line with Abraham. Standard hope, fine. But unusual hope, that's where God, that's where God really has somebody to work with. Praise God. Abraham's unusual hope had a worldwide impact. He was the father of many nations. Listen, it, it sounds like I'm, tr I'm tr trying to trick you into doing something crazy, but this level of hope had a worldwide impact. The reason we're not having a worldwide impact is we don't have crazy hope. We always bring our hope down to normal, to usual hope. Unusual hope is what God's after. The kind of unusual hope that'll change the world, the father of many nations. Even when Abraham looked at his situation, hope prevailed. And that's what is powerful about Abraham. So awesome. All right. So another critical item in our spiritual survival kit, which we're going to grab before we run out the proverbial door. <laughs> another item is, is our Bible. I want to talk about the Bible for a while. This Bible right here. Because your Bible is connected to your faith. I don't know if you know this, but your Bible is connected to your faith. The relationship you have with your Bible is connected to your faith level. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Keeping our faith strong comes through a solid foundation in the Bible. If the preacher is preaching out of the comics... Okay, I mean, the comics are fine. <laughs> I mean, I like the comics. <laughs> but if that's all you're getting, you need to get the Bible. You, you need to have the Bible because your faith is connected to the Bible. Yes. Keeping our faith strong comes through a solid foundation in the Bible. You should be reading it all the time. I mean, con you know, constantly. Have your kids read it. Read all the stories. Know it all. It's fantastic. I want you to consider this. God has put the highest endorsement on your Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The Bible is, that's the highest endorsement you can get. You, you can base your life on it. The things you believe are true forever. By the way, Isaiah 48, 40 verse 8 says, the grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Yes. Not one jot or tittle will be taken out of the law till everything is complete, said Jesus. It is, a, it is something you can base your life on. The very book, those very words, you can trust. You should believe the words of this Bible over your own thoughts. Yes. I don't know if you've ever thought of that, but you should believe them over your own thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. People who know and read the Bible, you hardly ever hear them say, I just can't figure out what the will of God is. I just can't figure out what the will of God is. You know why? Because the will of, because Psalm 40, verse 8 says, I delight to fulfill your will, my God, for your living words are written upon the pages of my heart. The will of God and the word of God are the same thing. Come on. The will of God and the word of God, the will of God is contained right here. And the better you know this, the better you know you're going to know the will of God. And so it's like, it's like the will for your, God's, God's will in your life just opens up before you as you know the word. And it becomes less and less of a mystery and more and more revealed. It's like magic. <laughs> Don't be offended at the word magic. I use it in a very innocent way. So people who know and read the Bible know the will of God for their lives. They usually can easily find the will of God. People who know and read the Bible are able to fight the enemy. Ephesians 6, 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's powerful. People who know and read the Bible, the more word they have, the more life 
the more Zoe life, is that the word Zoe? Zoe life is upon them. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We live by the word that comes from the mouth of God. More word, more life. More word, more life. We need to love our Bible. We need to love the Bible. That's a good one. So that, put that one in your backpack, right guys? Your survival kit. And I want to talk about love. I want to finish by talking about love, of what's in your survival kit. You need to keep your love for, okay, this is a prophetic word for 2021, for sure, for sure. Talking about the love of God. You need to keep your personal love for God the very, very highest priority. Your love for God needs to be your very highest priority. And don't make your life about somebody else's love story. Here's what we do. We make our life, we, we listen to other people that fall in love with God, and we're like, wow, you really fell in love with God. And, and you healed people, and you went out and did this, and wow, you had a miraculous life. And the pleasantness of their story, we think, is love. We take that as love. And that's not. That's just a nice story that happened to somebody else. You, you aren't even approaching love yet. You're just hearing a nice love story. If you hear the story of me and Tammy and how we met and how we fell in love, it's just the most beautiful story you ever heard. Sure. And, then, and then if you say, isn't that so nice? You may think the wonderful niceness is the total of what happened, but I am telling you absolutely not. The big difference is I lived through it. And the story is immensely magical to me. And to you, it's just a nice story. You have no idea what the story means to me because I lived through it. Is that cool? Okay, the Pharisees miss God in this same way. John 5, 39, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. You, you hear the stories, oh, they're all so good, these stories are great, but you don't come to me and fall in love with me personally. You just hear the stories. Don't let it be somebody else's love story. Let it be your love story. Let the, let the love of God become your love story. Let it be what you are going to experience this year, that you're going to fall in love with God. It's going to just, and you're, you're going to be like, you know, what's a mystery? <laughs> what's a mystery is that, you know, they write a million love songs and they do a million cards and stuff like that. And then finally, when a young person finally does fall in love, he's like, oh my gosh, now I know why they wrote so many love songs. Oh my gosh, now I know why they do all this stuff. It never made any sense to me before. Or they think, and this is a good thing too, they think nobody else, this is actually scriptural, nobody else has ever felt the way I do right now in the whole world. And then so they'll write their own new song thinking they break a new territory. Are you hearing me? This is way, the way it's supposed to be between you and God. I, this is a new thing. This is new. You're, 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 you're blazing new territory because you're falling in love like nobody else has. And actually, nobody has fallen in love the way you're going to fall in love with God. You know, he gives you a stone with a name written on it that only you understand. Wow. This is everything to me. This is everything I ever dreamed of, I ever hoped for, I ever wanted. Everything is in this name. And only me and you know it, God. Yeah. That's powerful love. Yeah. Whew, that's good. So keep your personal love the highest priority. How God draws us into deeper love. Here's how God draws us into this deeper love. I'm just going to give you, he, he's, he's like playing a trick on you to get you closer. It's not a trick, but this is, he's trying to draw you closer and closer and closer. And this is the way he does it. First, we hear his voice. Isaiah 30, 21. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And then sometimes we see the Lord. So we hear his voice sometimes. And sometimes we see the Lord. Psalm 119, 18 says, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. But here, we, we hear his voice and we see 
we see him, but God does not want it to end there. He wants it to go so much farther. farther. It's like if you saw your girlfriend's picture and you, and you heard her voice or you, or you had a letter from her and you have her picture and then the opportunity to meet in real life comes up and maybe to get together and to be with her and maybe develop this relationship, someday you can marry her and you're like, nah, I'm fine. I got the picture and I got the letter. I am telling you. Okay. Yeah. The whole point is to go further. The whole point is to have more. Listen in Acts 17, 27. It says, God did all these things to make himself known. So God gave his word. He gave pictures of who he is to make himself known so that men would do something, would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. <laughs> Sometimes we, like the Pharisees, you know, we have his word and his picture. That's what, I've got everything I need. But I want to tell you something. A hunger needs to spring up in us. A hunger needs to spring up in us. Uh, it's a hunger until we're not satisfied, until we experience his presence until we're in his presence, who we're falling in love with him. That changes your life. When you fall in love with the Lord, it changes your life forever. You could try to force yourself to do a hundred good things, and it's, it's such a drudgery. Well, once you fall in, Lord, in love with the Lord, you, you, you do a thousand things, and you don't even care. It's a joy. It's life. It's glorious. Hello. That is so, 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 so good. All right. This mix of feelings and motives and thoughts that we have for God when we fall in love with him is a hard thing to describe. It is a hard thing to describe. So God uses a very personal idea, and it's in Revelation 2.3. He says this, You have persevered. You have endured hardships for my name. You have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. And he uses the word first love. And I think that's so amazing. Why is he puts the idea of first love? Because that's what he wants. God's saying, I want, to, I want to connect. I want you to connect with me with the same feeling you had when you felt first love. Whatever that same feeling was when you felt first love. And I don't care who it was for. When you felt first love, I want you to connect with me with that same feeling. Because that's the most powerful thing. That is the most powerful thing ever. And God's referring into your history to pull that memory out and say, I want, I want that between me and you. <laughs> wow. He's going into your heart. He's pulling out your first love memory and he's saying, that's what I want. I want to connect with you with that kind of love. <clears throat> that's so, so... And when that happens, suddenly this has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with church. There's, some, there's something else going on. Woo, that you cannot explain. It's hard to explain. You try. You, you spend 100 words talking to your friends about the Lord. And, and it's just so hard to explain why you're so excited about it. You know, you use words like, I just, you know, I'm just excited about the Lord. And they're like, yeah, 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 I know. We're all excited about the Lord, son. <laughs> It's like, no, no, I really love the Lord. Yeah, 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 that's really nice, son. We're all in love with the Lord. No, 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 you don't understand. I'm like, I'm like I, saw the, I saw God. Yeah, yeah, we all see God in our hearts. Yeah, I, because, because you cannot describe what's going on, but it's a real experience to you. And that's what God wants. That's what God wants. Yes. God has everything, but what he really wants is your love in return. Okay, people, people write a million songs and God writes a million songs about the desire to love you too. And all of it, all, everything God does is in the hope of getting your love in return. He loves you and he's trying to get you to love him back. Everything he does is for that purpose. Song of Solomon 4 verse 9 says, You have stolen my heart, my sister, my bride. You have stolen my heart with one glance of your eyes. And he's, this is the Lord basically talking to the church or to the believer. 
And he's saying, you don't understand what you do to me. Why I pursue you with all my energy to try to capture you. You don't understand what's happening to me. But because with us, and, and if you think back of how love works, there is a very real chance that the person you're chasing could ignore you. Remember that feeling? Because they have free will, and God honors your free will. There is a very real chance that the desire of his heart, when he goes to pursue a person, when he goes to try to love them and capture them, that they are going to ignore him. And yet this story happens with every person on the planet. He's like, I want you. I'm pursuing you. I'm after you. And it's like, shut down. But when a person returns the feelings that God has for them, returns them back, it's overwhelming to him. And there's nothing like it. It blesses his heart. The same, do you think we invented this feeling of, of desiring the spark and then all of a sudden love's returned and then the feeling that you get from that? No, that didn't come from humans. That came from God because that's exactly the way he's feeling about you. And when you come to worship and you return adoration to the Lord, I love you, Lord. I lay my life down for you. That's what happens in his heart is this response of, yes, I'm pursuing you. That's what he wants. That's what he wants from us. That's why love has to stay supreme. Love has to stay paramount. That's the number one thing. Love, for God, love is his highest priority. So we read it again, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love because everything else is simple. When, when we're in a love relationship with God. Praise God. Well, let's stand up. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your daily goodness towards us. We thank you so much that this hope is eternal. The fact that you are going to bring into our lives something brand new, continually something to bless us, something that, that, that is such an amazing expectation. Lord God, I just thank you that that's part of our life. And I pray we get good at hope. I pray we get really good at hope. We know that you're going to work things out, Lord God. And then, Lord, I pray that turns into faith. I pray that we would start getting downloads and also through the word of God and through hearing your word and meditating on your word that we would start to understand what you are saying, what your thoughts are, Lord God. And as we understand, we see the world differently. And Lord, to other people, it's going to seem like unusual faith, but to us, it's just acting according to what we see because we're seeing according to the kingdom of God. And I pray that would begin to happen to us, Lord God. And I pray, Lord, above all things, that this love that you want to ignite in us in this year and grow in us would just expand and grow, Lord God. You would, you would captivate us with your love and we would return the love to you. And we just thank you for it. We say we belong to you. We say we are yours. We say we love you, Lord God. We love you.